Okay, welcome everyone. We'll give everyone a couple of minutes to say hello uh, in the comment bar if you want to leave your name, what team you're on, if you're from the middle school. We'll give everyone a few seconds. It's our, our official last virtual interview. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Susan Spindle. Susan is in the fashion industry, a fashion merchandiser, um, which I, I honestly don't know much about. So I'm very much looking forward to the interview and learning about the career. So Susan, why don't you start by, uh, could you tell us what does it mean to be a fashion merchandiser? Absolutely happy to do that. It's um, my job does involve fashion merchandising, but it also involves selling product. And I'll tell you how that kind of dovetails together. I work in the hosiery, legwear, lingerie industry. And my role is really to work with the key customers, big department stores, specialty stores, um, Kohl's, QVC, Macy's, those kinds of customers. And I work with them to sell my product, but the fashion merchandising piece of it is that I try to tailor products that are meant for these stores to give them something a little bit more individual, maybe to be part of their private label offerings. So if Kohl's has a brand out there called Sonoma, I'm actually creating product that will go under the Kohl's label. So it's a little selling, it's a little product development and merchandising. Uh, but for me, it actually all started by uh, going into retailing. And I started my career after graduating from a small liberal arts college and majoring in English, which as you can tell, has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. I went to work for Bloomingdale's. They have something called the executive training program. So it didn't really matter that I had no preparation for this industry because they were happy to train me and teach me all about it. So that's where it started for me. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So like Target has their own like Jack and Jill, I think. It's Correct. Stocks. So you would help Target to develop a product, a sock, a, a stocking, a tight, because you said hosiery, that then they would label Jack and Jill. Absolutely true. And remember, all of these retailers have sort of a different point of view because Target doesn't want to look like Kohl's and Kohl's right. doesn't want to look like Macy's. So the real trick involved in fashion merchandising is how am I going to make my various customers look slightly different and have their own signature. So there's a lot that goes into it. But what I did want to mention, because I'm sure uh, there are people that maybe want to go into fashion design, maybe they've got a background in art or in drawing. I have none of that. So basically what I'm bringing to um, the industry is an ability to see what's out there and help my customers translate what's already out there to their product categories. And a lot of this has to do with trends. So you may not be aware, but everybody that is a consumer sees trends. They just may not realize that they're seeing the trends. There could be a color. There are seasons when everything seems to be purple and other seasons where everything is coral. So these things um, are used by these major retailers so that they can put a point of view on their product that makes them the most appealing to the customer going into the store. And it, it can be fabric, it can be color, it can be designs. And when you think of trends, it's not only the trends that you see in the world of clothing, but remember, so many things influence trends. It could be music, it could be restaurants, it could be reality television. So trends come from absolutely everywhere. Somebody like me is tasked with the responsibility of taking those trends and trying to incorporate them into a product line that will sell well for our major retail partners. So I'm gonna, I, you mentioned hosiery, so I'm trying to you know, put everything into perspective. I noticed the kids are wearing, again, like the high up socks. 
like for a while the low socks are in. Now I see my kids are pulling their socks like up over their sweatpants and their leggings. I work at the middle school, so I'm privy to all the uh, the newest, the hottest trends. Um, I'm sure you are. Yeah, to to touch the season. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess then if you saw that trend coming, now you would say to Target, okay, we have to market, you know, socks that this is what the kids are wearing. This is the trend. This is what we see coming, and help them to design, you know, a product that would reflect the the trend. That's, so that's absolutely true. And you were seeing all of those high socks during a particular season because mm -hmm. you have to remember there's also a seasonality to what's happening in the world of fashion. You're not likely, if stores ever reopen, that is, to mm -hmm. go into a store and see a lot of wool and cashmere when you go into a store, hopefully by May 1st. You're not going to see that because there's a seasonality. So in the world of socks, you won't be seeing too many of the high socks. You won't be seeing too many tights. You're going to see shorter shop, uh, socks, no shows, mm -hmm. things of lighter fabrications, lighter colors, because you're also, you need to have the right seasonally appropriate merchandise out there on the selling floor or on e-commerce to suit the needs of the customer during a given time frame. So, so for any student who has a knack for, you know, spotting different trends or what, or sees themselves as a trendsetter, this is definitely a career option. If they're naturally good at spotting the trends and seeing the upcoming trends, this is this would be a good field. Absolutely true. And there's another piece of this. And these words are used quite a lot in my industry. I don't know if they translate to any other industry, but it's called white space. So you might say, what is white space? Well, white space is I call the Kohl's buyer. I want to make a presentation of my products to sell those products. The Kohl's buyer says, I deal with dozens of vendors. I need somebody to fill my white space. What can you bring me? So that's what white space is. You don't need to take an assortment of things to Kohl's that the buyer has already purchased. What you need to do is find what's missing. So if you have students that love to shop and maybe there's a store that they frequent and maybe there's a department within that store they go to all the time because they like to buy the, the clothing there, they might already have this awareness and not even know that they have it because I then need to go to Kohl's or to Macy's or Nordstrom or Penny's and I have to find what's missing. Where are the trends going? How is this retailer perhaps not uh, staying with the trends that are important to their business right now? And how can I bring them the product that will fill what they call that white space? So there is a lot of analysis that is involved um, when I want to find the white space for any particular customer, for any particular season. I, it sounds so funny, but this is really part of what I do for a living. I have to shop the store. So I need to go to the store. I need to take a lot of pictures. I need to take a lot of notes. I need to look at everything that they have. What are the fabrics? What are the price points? Um, what are the different silhouettes and designs that they currently have? I'll even go so far as to say, what do they have a lot of? And they have a lot, not because it's popular, but because they bought too much of it and it's not popular. And another telling way to see what's working or what's not working is to look at what's been marked down. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't count when you're shopping TJ Maxx and Marshalls because everything there mm -hmm. is marked down. But what does a Kohl's or a Macy's or a Nordstrom have where there's a lot of it sitting on a, on a markdown fixture or in a bin where styles that are marked down have been thrown into a big bin? Because this could be the answer to something they had that did not work. And if it didn't work, I don't want to bring it back to them and say, hi, this is what you're missing. Because all I'm doing is bringing them a liability to their assortments. So lots of shopping has to happen. So if you're like me and you're a big fan of green and orange, you, I do well on the sale rack because I think the store typically buy too much. <laughs> people 
other than we don't care for. Okay, uh, Kevin, I know you have a bunch of questions. Yeah, I do. Before I ask that, I have to find out what is what is the in color right now, Susan? I want to make sure that, I, that I'm up on everything. Uh, I'd love to tell you. I haven't been in a store in many weeks, Kevin, but mm -hmm. The stores were heading to a very peachy coral coloration as being uh, the big color. The other thing that was beginning to trend before the business dropped dead, um, small floral prints, uh, what you might call a liberty print, very small, pretty florals, very feminine florals. Now, when the doors to the stores reopen, and we all help, God willing, that will be soon, um, those things will probably be in the stores because they will not have had an opportunity to sell through because nobody's shopping in the stores right now. Right. We are shopping online, though. So if you want to see what the trends are, the digital platforms are the way to really look at the trends right now. I noticed the nail polish colors um, on the Target website were that peach and like green. I, I bought a little kit and I noticed those were the end colors. So. Well, you know, there's an entire industry. And again, it it, uh, it harkens back to businesses that you didn't even know existed until you got into your business. There are trend services that many of these retailers use where you're paying a fee. And the, the, there are two seasons in retailing. I don't know if everybody knows that. It's spring and fall. So spring is the spring and the summer season. And fall is really fall and winter. So if you take a calendar and you split it in half, six months of spring, six months of fall. Now, the six months of spring is not the big season. It's a much lighter season as far as dollars. People tend to spend a lot more of their money in a fall season. Very logically speaking, Christmas falls in the fall season. So that drives a lot of business. But uh, getting back to the whole idea of trends, there are trend services that retailers will uh, pay to receive the service that will give them the spring trend forecasts as well as the fall trend forecasts. And then when they have an overall idea of the colors and the fabrics and the prints and the patterns, they'll start to put their assortments together. Very often they will dial in somebody like me on the early side because they like to set the table with private label first. Now that really makes sense to a retailer because calls would actually kind of prefer that you're buying one of their private brands, the Sonomas and, and um, the Apartment Nines and those brands. And why you might ask, do they prefer that? Uh, it's really financial reasons because they make generally more money on those products. So they talk to people like me that will create their private label programs because they, they feel that will be uh, the biggest portion of their business and hopefully the most profitable. But after that, they have brands that they know the consumer is looking for. So they need to have those well-known brands in addition, but they set the table with private label and then they layer in other brands to put the rest of their assortment together. That's great. I feel like I've learned so much already. Thank you. <laughs> I want access to that trend forecasting thing. So. And, and you know what? They probably have it, Allison, for individuals. I'm not aware of what those services are, but I'm certain that they exist. Yeah, I need that. I'm going to look at it. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin, go ahead. That's okay. So Susan, I wanted to bring it back to the beginning, honestly. So, you know, you had said that you had your degree in English. Then I think you said you started a job in retail at Bloomingdale. So how, how was it exactly that you got into this profession? It was so random, Kevin. I wish I could tell you it was well thought out and it was planned. And I always knew from seventh grade on where I wanted to go. But I would be lying if I told you that. We had a number of uh, big companies that recruited at my college. And during my senior year, I signed up to interview with some larger companies. One of them was Bloomingdale's. And it was really literally the only job offer that I had when I was graduating college. And I scheduled to start with them on July 7th. But I figured I was graduating in early June. It gave me a little time to look around a bit more to see if there were other opportunities. 
And there may have been a couple of others, but nothing so compelling um, that made me say, nope, I'm not going to stay with this offer from Bloomingdale's. So I went into the program. I spent almost four years because you start as a trainee, but then you work your way up through the ranks. So your first promotion is to be an assistant buyer. And after that, now remember, this is back in the day, so I can't speak to how it is now. But after I was an assistant buyer, I was promoted out to a branch store. And in the branch store, I managed about seven different departments. Um, and that was a very involved job as well. And it, it taught me a lot about different categories within the world of fashion accessories, which many years later is where I still exist. But what was very pivotal for me was probably around 25 years old, a friend's father, who was a very big executive in an industry, not at all related to retailing, said, you know, I think you're on the wrong side of the fence here. You're on the buying side, but I feel that based on your personality, you would do much better if you went on to the selling side. And I thought that made some sense. So that's when I decided instead of being a buyer, I'm going to become a seller. And that was the path I continued to follow up until this time. But it wasn't very much planned. I'm being very honest here. So now what, what do you think that, that that person had kind of identified in you as skills or characteristics that you had, you know, to have you kind of switch sides there? So easy for me to tell you that, Kevin, I talk a lot. Okay, so he thought that since I talk a lot, um, I could probably talk to many different kinds of people. I'm not uncomfortable speaking to strangers. I'm not uncomfortable, as you know, because we've met in person, being in front of a room to talk to people. So I would tell anybody out there that's listening, if the selling aspect interests you, you probably already know if you have a comfort level of speaking to people. If you're very, very shy, there might be some industries that could work for you, maybe a more technical product, you're working one on one, but you need to be kind of a talker to get up in front of a room to make a big presentation to a lot of executives. Mm -hmm. but talking is really the key here for me, Kevin, and that's what caused this individual who was the CEO of a very large company to say to me, yeah, you're kind of wasting your talents. I think you need to, to be in sales, not in buying. And now, was that a skill that you feel like you always had? You know, were you always comfortable up in front of a room, in front of people? Or? Yes, and I saw some of the sample questions that you guys provided. And uh, one of the questions had to do with what did you do in school? Or what do you think um, a student could do in school that might better prepare them for this? And I would tell you without hesitation, for me, it was theater. And it was a speech and a speech class that I took that literally work with you to help you develop the ability to stand in front of a room. And it was harsh at times because they would record you, they would play it back, you would have to look at yourself. It could be very embarrassing, but it prepared me well. The other thing, but I'm gonna bring it much more current, that's been helpful for me very recently, I got our product onto QVC. So everybody knows that format. So I literally spent an entire day doing training at QVC to make me ready to go on live television. So it was a very tough day because again, it was like going back to that high school speech class where everybody is critiquing you, but now you've got professionals. You've got these, these people that are on air all the time at QVC and they're watching you and they're telling you what to do and they're, you know, making recommendations. So you know, you take it as constructive criticism. They're doing it for one reason only. They want you to be better able to go on air and sell your product. But boy, was that worth it for me. The speech classes, the theater classes, being in just about every play in high school and, and middle school too. Um, but that's the kind of preparation that, you know, there are kids out there right now that are doing that as we speak, but they're not really maybe thinking how that could come into play down the road, but it really can. Yeah. And, and I tie it into Oceanside, you know, at the high school, at least Allison, you can speak to the middle school, but we offer public speaking. We offer theater classes. We have all of those things, you know, which is great to hear. 
Well, if there are kids that might be interested in selling a product, a service, it doesn't have to just be socks and hosiery like me. There are many, many other things that require talented salespeople. But if they want to help themselves um, get a little step ahead, then I would say speech classes and theater is one of the best things they can do right now. That's great. Great, thanks. Um, so, Susan, what is like a, a typical day? You know, you're in on a, a Monday or a Tuesday. What does a typical day look like for you? Well, I would love to have a typical day because right now, it's not, it's <laughs> sure, not sure. But if I were to give you a typical day, maybe for six weeks ago, um, there's a lot of communications with your buyers. Uh, there's a lot of attention that needs to be paid on any given day to deadlines because most of the product that I am creating, and again, I don't design it, but I work with a really talented design team to help translate these trends. Um, I would say I'm kind of the go-between between between the buyers who are developing Mm -hmm. product and between our team of designers and sourcing people. So, A typical day is definitely being in touch with my uh, retailers to find out, are we on track? Um, Has the buyer written the orders yet? Can I start processing the orders? Most of the product in my industry is made in the Far East. So there are lead times that you need to be aware of. And most of my retail partners have their own calendar. So I have to be sure that I'm staying on track with their calendar. So that's definitely a big part of the day. I'm also looking to review the selling. If I have product out there right now, how is it performing? Is it doing well or is it ending up on that markdown table? Because if it's on the markdown table, that it's obviously not something that the retailer is going to want more of. Um, There's a lot of, I guess you could say cold calling, a lot of prospecting, reaching out to people that um, that I'd like to get them interested in my product. In fact, that's the way I, I got involved with QVC. I was on social media. I saw that they were having a contest. They wanted to find people, new vendors with product that was unique and different. So again, Although the only format for QVC really is either watching the show or going online, I had to shop them. I had to see what do they already have? How can I offer them something different? And I came up with product that was different. I made the first cut. I then went to present to them uh, in a format with a panel of about six to eight different buyers. They agreed that I brought something different to the table And that's how I was able to open up that venue for my company. So another part of the day is looking around what's out there, whether I'm working, walking into a physical store or I'm doing my research online to see what does this prospective customer need? Now, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of rejection involved, too. Uh, The world's best pitch and you can have the perfect item to fill the white space. The buyer still may take a pass. And sometimes you'll find out why, sometimes you won't. But um, I know the original question was, what's a typical day? These are some of the elements to a typical day for me. So, so that was going to be my question. I mean, what are the, I, I want to know what you enjoy most um, would be my first question. And then my second question would, would be about when there's disappointment, when things aren't going well, what are the challenges? I definitely I also want to know what you sold on QV states. My <laughs> I was curious to know that also. When my, when my- I actually sold tights with cats and dogs and a plaid pattern. Well, if my grandmother was alive, I guarantee you <laughs> I'd have at least two pair of each. And so would my sister. And so would my mother. I'll tell you what, when I come next spring, when, when Kevin runs this again and I come in person, I'll bring the tights and you can see if maybe you want a pair, Alice. She was a big fan of QVC <laughs> and I had it all. <laughs> so I would say my favorite part is probably the product development and talking to my buyers. Um, obviously, sometimes it's good news, sometimes it's it's bad news, but I love the product portion of it. But again, I didn't have any training for that. The product development piece came out of um, my selling because the more you sell a product and the more educated you become, the more, again, you're able to see what the voids are. And that's been you know, kind of my secret weapon, being able to find what they need 
that they might not know that they need. Mm -hmm. But that leads into the hardest part, which is the presentation that you put together and maybe you fly out with your samples and your trend boards and everything else. And, you know, you put on a great presentation, but then the retailer lets you know, I'm sorry, my budget for the department was cut and I can't bring in a new vendor. So that's disappointing. The other thing that's disappointing is if you develop what you thought was a great product, maybe the product doesn't work. Maybe you miss something. Maybe it doesn't resonate. Maybe it's a little too expensive and you have to react. So, you know, it, it, there's the good and then there's, you know, the more negative side of it, which comes with any career. But again, as a salesperson, you always tend to focus more on the positive because you couldn't do the job you're doing if you didn't present both yourself at your company and your product in a very positive way. Nobody wants to deal with a, you know, a, an unhappy, miserable salesperson mm -hmm. because that doesn't help anybody. So you need to stay upbeat even when the going gets tough. Right. Kevin? Yeah, so you know, more to our students now, how can students who are interested in this field actually get experience? Do you have any insight, you know, as to what they can get involved in now? You know, you mentioned some elective classes, but any other things? Well, if there is a product category, and again, it may be way too early in their lives to know, but you could get some store experience. That's a great way to learn more. Maybe you pick up a, a, a part-time job working for a store that you like, that you frequent, yeah. you know, because if you like the product, then you're almost an endorsement for that product. And then you're able mm -hmm. um, to learn about it and surround yourself with product that you like and become very knowledgeable. So mm -hmm. that's one way I can think of. The other thing, and again, middle schoolers are too young for this. High schoolers are getting closer to it. Internships in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, you have to do your research. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you. And obviously the internship situation right now has turned a little bit um, difficult for many people that were college students in particular that were looking right. for that summer internship. Right. But I say try a part-time job or on the other hand, speak to people that do this. There's a lot of people like me out there that know at this point they're not able to pay this forward. You know, they 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 can't they can't pay back the people that help them, but they certainly are more than willing to speak to kids that might be interested. And and I been doing that for years. If there's a kid interested in the, well, one of your guys, one of your coworkers, Kevin, uh, mm -hmm. she and I go way back because our boys are best friends. And over the years, if she's known a kid that had an interest in the fashion industry, she'll say, would you talk to my friend's daughter? Right. We're happy to do that. You want to give kids the insight that they might need. There's always somebody out there willing to tell you how they got their start and maybe help you shape shape yourself so that you can you know, enter or follow a similar path. That's great. You know, I found this really, it, we've learned so much um, over the course of the past few weeks doing these interviews that we want to take back to our students. Um, and there are surely middle school students, high school students are very interested in trends and style. And, you know, I, I think, you know, retail and brands and, you know, material labels. So it was really nice to hear that, like, something that they really enjoy right now um, could actually potentially be a career. Um, and you know, we continue to look for ways at both the middle and high school to help students make connections between their interests, their natural strengths, talents, abilities, characteristics, and possible careers. We want them to see those connections between, you know, liking public speaking and talking with other people and, you know, being passionate about there's a, you know, a seller right there, right? Someone who likes that, but also has a little niche, you know, with, with fashion. So this was very, it's, th these interviews have been very helpful, I think, not only for the students, but for, you know, the, the staff members, the adults as well. We will bring some of this back to the school. Well, so it was my pleasure. And I hope that you. Kevin will call me next year and we'll have it in a more person to person yeah. format. And I'll, be, and I'll look for you on QVC. <laughs> Please do. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, to our viewers, uh, Mr. Blau, who's been here every day, and Vincent Capone and James Healy, um, 
some of the guidance counselors from the high school. I just want to thank everyone for your support, um, for being part of our virtual speaker interview series. Um, our show is coming to an end, and we'll look forward to seeing you back at school soon. Thank you, everyone. Be safe, be well, and enjoy the holiday if you're celebrating. Thank you. I need to get her back on the the.